Hello everyone, welcome to MIP Biology Unit 4.3 Sensory Receptors. Today we're going to learn about the sensory organs and sensory receptor. What is the function of a sensory receptors? Uh, probably majority of you know from the primary science that sensory receptors they detect a stimulus, transform it into electrical signal, which is then it's sent to the central nervous system. It detected interpretation is going on, and then comes back and we respond to the stimuli. So you know, guys, that our five major senses are the taste smell, hearing, seeing, and touch. Those are the five essential senses for the um, all living organism, especially the, uh, let's say, all um, vertebrates. So we've got type of sensory receptors, location, and stimulus detected. Um, so. First, let's get started with the baroreceptor. They are located in the walls of the blood vessels. As you know, uh, blood vessels, each blood vessel has a certain pressure, such as you know that arteries has the highest pressure, then goes the veins and capillaries. So blood pressure is very important and here in the walls of the blood, the baroreceptor is really responsible for the pressure. In camera receptors, they are located in the tongue, nose, and they are responsible for the taste and smell. Photo receptors in the retina of the eye, uh, there are actually mm, photo receptors we call roads and cones that they detect uh, light, uh, whether they're in the dark or in the bright light and it enables us to see. Mechanoreceptors are located in the skin, in your ear, in muscles. They're responsible for the touch, pressure, hair movement, sound vibration, stretching of muscles. Osmoreceptors are in the hypothalamus of the brain and they're responsible for the solute concentration of body fluids. You know, uh, hypothalamus is very important um, gland for us because it, uh, it, it, it controls all the uh, secreting glands. Thermal receptors are located in the skin and by these thermal receptors we can feel whether it's hot or cold for us. So remember those type of sensory receptors because they're an important location of sensory org organs. Guys, um, you know that not all living organisms have uh, the head to have all sensory organs around it. Some uh, organs, some some organisms like such as sea anemone, starfish, they have those sensory receptors all around their body. They do not have a head, they do not have the certain parts, so they feel or they sense uh, all over their body. So when um, an animal or organism has a head, so we call it cephalization. Cephalization is actually um, uh, the concentration of sense organs, nervous control system uh, at the inter interior end of the body, forming a head and brain, both during evolution or in the course of embryo's development. So cephalization is actually forming a head and uniting all sensory organs in the head. So uh, we're going to have the discussion time here to, because we will talk about whether it's a good to have all sensory organs um, in the head or not all over our body. So which group of animals develop head and which not? What is the function of a head and reason for the main sense organs being located in the head? And uh, we're going to suggest whether it's like advantages or disadvantages of sense organs being located elsewhere in the body. Here, uh, first sensory receptors of the eyes. Today we're going to talk about eyes and ears. So let's get started. You see the um, naked eyes in front of us and we're going to detect and dissect it. So here first is the iris. Iris is actually the colored part of the eye, uh, which can be can expand and contract uh, and control amount of light entering the eyes. It can be blue, brown, it can be gray. So uh, mostly in our country, uh, people have the brown iris. 
Uh, cornea. Cornea is a transparent layer responsible for refraction of light rays that enter your eyes, and cornea covers all the eye, not only the front part but also the rear back part. Uh, pupil is that that little black part we call the pupil. It's a circular opening which lets light into the eye. But you might ask why it's the black? Because behind it, there their cells contain uh, melanin pigment that prevents pupil refracting the light back. That's why it's actually black because it doesn't refract the light. Retina contains light-sensitive cells, roots, and cones. By these light-sensitive cells, we can see in bright light in dark. Uh, fovea contains high density of the cones, which works full efficiency in bright light. Um, optic nerve uh, composed of sensory neurons which carry nerve impulses to the visual center at the rear of the brain. In blind spot, the exit point of the optic nerve and there are no light sensitive cells here so light falling on this region cannot be detected. Roads and cones are the photoreceptors and roads are responsible for um, seeing for the sight in the dim dark uh, light and cones are responsible for the bright light. So uh, here their distribution roads are found in the full they are found in the retina but none of them in the center of fovea so provide us with the night vision cones are actually concentrated in the fovea and there are three types they are sensitive to red green and blue lights now here we have good questions related to eye so what's the reason for the people appearing black Blue eyes are common in some human population but are absent from others. Identify some parts of the world where all of the indigenous population has brown eyes and explain the reason for this. So what are the advantages of having two eyes rather than one? Now, next sensory organ is going to be hearing. So, um, our ear is um, divided into three parts. The external ear, medial ear, and inner ear. So, external ear starts with the pina. And then the sound actually goes to the ear canal, passes through the ear canal to the eardrum. Then... Uh, in the, the, the after ear drum, the medial ear starts, and we have got ossicles, three little bones uh, that they are actually, let's say, vibrating and sending the sound to the inner ear. So these ossicles are actually in the middle, and they uh, they um, let's they welcome the external and inner ear. So they are actually the transportation part. So inner ear is uh, the made of the cochlea, uh, which is like a, mm, a snail-like organ. Cochlea is full of the fluid. So this fluid takes the sound vibration, turns into the electrical signals and send it to the um, sensory organ, uh, central nervous system. Uh, as you see, this uh, the cochlea is full of fluid and it has little um, hairs. So those hairs are actually catching the sound vibration, and the, you know, ossicles actually increase the vibration for twenty times. And after it is increasing this vibration. The ossicle, the sound vibrations are coming through those hairy uh, cochlea in the fluid and then it's sent back to the um, central nervous system by electrical signal. So we here have a video, here we have a video to watch about the ears, so let's see. How are you listening to this music right now? Well, you might know that your speakers are creating sound and your ears are listening to it. But there's a lot more going on over here. You see, all your speakers are doing right now is vibrating the particles of the air close to it. Then they vibrate the air molecules close to them and so on and so forth. And we call this a sound wave. And eventually, when the air molecules close to your ears start vibrating, we hear sound. 
But how does something as boring as air molecules going back and forth make us experience something like this? Well, for that, we need to look at our ear carefully. I mean the entire structure of the ear. So let's look at how the different parts of the ear work together to make us experience sound. So our ear can be divided into three parts. The outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear starts with the pinna. It's the part that you can see and touch, or in my case, the part that my mom would twist quite often. Its job is to collect as much sound waves as possible and channel it into the auditory canal. The sound waves pass through the auditory canal and eventually meet the eardrum, which is shown in green over here. The eardrum is a transparent membrane which is super sensitive to the vibrations of the air. So as the air vibrates, even the eardrum starts vibrating, just like the skin of a drum. And as you can see, the eardrum also separates the outer ear from the middle ear. This brings us to the middle ear. The middle ear consists of the three tiniest bones of the human body and they're together called the ossicles. And they have pretty cool names. They're called the malleus, the incus, and stapes. And here's the actual picture of these three bones. And because of their shapes, they're also commonly called as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Stirrup is where you rest your feet when you're riding your horse. All right, so as the eardrum vibrates, you can see the ossicles also start vibrating, transferring the vibrations from the eardrums to the inner ear. Now their main job is to increase or amplify the pressure of the sound waves when it reaches the inner ear. But why do we need to increase the pressure of the sound waves? Because as we will see, the inner ear consists of a liquid, not air. So the vibrations must transfer into a liquid. And you might already know that vibrating or moving particles of liquid is much harder than moving particles of air. Which is why it's very easy for you to swing your arms in the air, but it's pretty difficult to do that inside water, like say in a swimming pool. And so to set this liquid in vibration, the pressure has to be high enough. And in fact, it turns out that our ossicles increase the pressure of the sound about 20 times. But how do they do that? Well, just take a look at the base of the stapes. It has such a small area compared to that of the eardrum. So when the force gets transmitted from the eardrum to the stapes, it gets concentrated in a very tiny area. And you might know when you concentrate force in a very tiny area, you increase its pressure. And that brings us to the inner ear. The inner ear consists of a bony structure which is shown in purple. Now as you can see, the top part of this structure consists of three semicircular rings. They help us in maintaining our balance when walking or dancing or whatever we do. So they're not involved in hearing, so not so important for us. The part that's involved in hearing is this snail-like structure. This is called the cochlea. What does it do? Well, although these bones have already started dancing to the music, nothing gets heard until these vibrations are converted to electricity and sent to our brain. And that's exactly what the cochlea does. Now the cochlea is super complex and it's also a little mysterious. Even today, there are certain things about it we just don't know. And so we'll definitely not go into the details. But as mentioned earlier, it contains a liquid. 
And when the stirrup hits our cochlea, this liquid starts vibrating. And then there are some specialized cells in the cochlea that convert these vibrations into electrical signals. And these electrical signals go through the auditory nerves all the way to your brain where it gets finally interpreted as sound. And the cells of your cochlea are amazing. The electrical impulses that they generate are super sensitive to how loud the sound is or how feeble the sound is. Whether it is high frequency or low frequency. And as a result, your brain can differentiate the tiniest differences in the sound. And so you can understand different letters or words or even understand what I'm saying right now. Or hear the different notes of this music. And so to summarize, the outer ear collects the sound waves through the pinna and directs them to the eardrums. The three optical bones of the middle ear amplify these sound waves, transferring it into the cochlea. And the cochlea converts the back and forth vibrations of the particles into electrical signals and sends it to our brain. And regardless of how many words I use to describe what's going on, the very fact that the back and forth movement of the air can be converted into this amazing experience we call sound is truly unfathomable and beyond words. All right, guys. So uh, you've got an assignment. Tune in the orchestra, practicing resilience. You're going to read on page 108 on your book, and we're going to discuss about this one. So we've got review question. What is a sensory receptor? State some of sensory receptors. Talk about the sensory receptor of an eye. What about the ear? Discuss whether sound waves are passing through a solid, liquid, or gas at each stage in this sequence. You're going to answer all these questions. So if you don't answer any of these questions, so go back and review again. So thanks for watching, guys. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.